Our next speaker, speaker is Melina Veselo. She'll be talking about training of surgical endoscopists. When are you ready to do what? Pointer slide, okay. Um, hello, everyone, and thank you for the opportunity to present this topic, which I actually don't have the answer to, but I, I'm going to share with you a few of the thoughts um, that I have regarding this issue, which I think is, is a very hot topic now. And I'll try to focus really on the advanced uh, surgical endoscopists and the question of, of how we move forward from sort of the basic training. Uh, I have nothing to disclose. So I think that I won't belabor this point, and I think this has essentially been proven, and, and we, we all agree here that uh, surgeons can perform quality endoscopy. And I think it's important for us to demonstrate that quality, uh, but there is quite a bit of data out there suggesting that surgeons can do endoscopy, and I pretty much won't go through this. However, and we're all aware uh, of this um, sort of bomb that fell on us with the joint statement that the gastroenterology community is a bit doubtful about the numbers um, that the American Board of Surgery requires, uh, and, and this has put some pressure on all of us to, uh, to be more vigilant in the way that we're training, evaluating, uh, and proving the, the competence of surgeons to do endoscopy. And so what about training surgeons to do advanced endoscopy? There's, there's question even out there that we can even do sort of just basic diagnostic colonoscopy and gastroscopy. So what is really meant by advanced endoscopy? Does the fact that we're actually trained as surgeons have any impact or role to play? Is the learning curve shortened in some way? Or, and how can the simulation have a role to play in that? And, um, and how do we sort of assess competence and create benchmarks for some of these more advanced uh, procedures? So factors to consider when you're sort of thinking about the training of an advanced surgical endoscopist. So I think everybody is coming in with a different experience and sort of the handful of surgical endoscopy fellowships that are out there, I think, will, uh, will welcome a wide variety of, of people. And we've seen in, in what John presented that it really depends on what you're coming in with and the skill set that you're coming in with. And certainly the learning curve can be shortened if you've had previous experience. For example, uh, previous endoscopy experience can help to uh, shorten the learning curve for ERCP. But I think the goals and interests of the individual that's coming is obviously they can't learn the whole realm of, of advanced uh, and endoscopic procedures. It depends on what's available at the institution. Um, and of course, uh, some of the knowledge and skills that they've had throughout their residency and how that can transfer into some of the uh, endoscopic procedures. And John already went through these numbers, so, um, and I apologize for the, didn't look like this in the speaker ready room. <laughs> Um, so, so you can see here that, that this, we, for the moment, even for these advanced procedures, all we have is some recommendation of, of numbers that may be required in terms of, of determining competency. But again, um, there are a lot of uh, criticisms about whether or not numbers are really a good surrogate for competence. Um, but this is at least a, a good guideline that we might be able to use. But what about all the other stuff that you heard about this morning? I mean, there's tons of stuff that really doesn't have a defined number of how many cases you should do and, and what do you need to have done before to be able to do this? And what about emergencies and unpredictable things? And what's really the skill set? And how do you develop it? And, and this is obviously an ongoing and very quickly developing field. So how do we really prepare um, to perform a lot of these procedures. And of course, a lot of these are, are very surgeon-driven types of interventions to treat uh, GI disease in a more minimally invasive way. So there are no benchmarks for this type of stuff. And, and we don't really, I think, have very good or validated measures to define what competence means, um, nor you know, do we understand really what the learning curve is and does it really depend on how many, what the skill set you had coming in. So, like I mentioned, there are some people who suggest that perhaps experienced surgeons um, can learn endoscopy or acquire the skills required to perform endoscopy more quickly than novices. Um, we don't really know what the reason for this might be, and there isn't a whole lot of data to prove that. And I'll go through sort of a few little uh, studies that may 
may suggest that, but we don't know if it's just because you're sort of used to using two-dimensional uh, endoscopic kind of um, interface, or is it because you already sort of have a handle on the, on the actual disease process and the pathophysiology, or you just sort of have a, a paradigm in your mind about how to, how to learn a, an advanced skill set. Um, and I think motivation has a huge role. So if it's somebody doing an advanced therapeutic fellowship, I think they're very motivated to learn these very specific things and to go out and do them in their practice, uh, as opposed to perhaps a surgical resident who's not sure if they're ever going to do endoscopy in their practice or not. Um, and so do we think it counts for anything? And so Cass, who is the same individual who did the studies that, on which the ASGE numbers are based on, uh, did look at sort of acquisition of skills between surgeons and GI fellows and, and found no difference in the rate of, by which these skills were acquired. But of course, this was before um, minimally invasive surgery was really widespread at, within residency programs. Uh, and some people have looked at, at, at this question in the simulated environment. And um, in 2004, they did a study where they um, had some experienced endoscopists, some experienced laparoscopic surgeons um, do some tasks on both a GI mentor virtual reality endoscopy simulator and the Miss VR laparoscopic surgery simulator. And they did find that the experienced endoscopists performed well on the laparoscopic or Miss VR tasks. So there was some overlap in the skills there. And then in 2010, they did a crossover study with novices or complete novices just to see if the skills they acquired on the GI mentor translated to a surgical environment and vice versa. And there wasn't really any transfer of those skills except for maybe a slight improvement in camera navigation. So is there a crossover? Maybe a little. And what about the role for training, um, for simulation and training the advanced surgical endoscopist? So, most of the models or the simulation models out there for training in flexible endoscopy really focus on fundamentals and are really geared towards the novice. There are a few um, models out there or some explanted models and some of the stuff that you guys will be working with today in the hands-on component of the course that have been shown to approve uh, hemostasis and, and, and sort of some of these other um, uh, maneuvering polypectomy and so on. but. Um, other than that, there really isn't a whole lot of data out there to support the role for simulation. There are some um, ERCP and US simulators out there, but they're really just in the beginning parts, processes of being validated. Um, and again, we don't really have clinical outcome measures to really measure those simulator curricula against, so we don't really know if the, the skills in the, that are required in the simulator translate to the clinical environment yet but I do think that there definitely is a role uh, and there's a lot of work going on in this area. And simulation as a, as a means of assessment, so can this be integrated? Can you use simulation to really measure the skills um, that someone's acquired uh, and, and sort of as a benchmark or saying, okay, you've gone through the, this program or you're ready to go into the clinical environment. And like I said, there really isn't a lot of data out there specifically for advanced therapeutic endoscopy. Um, not really much out there for that yet. Uh, and John already mentioned this, so we have done as part of the FES uh, task force, uh, worked on sort of these very basic benchmarks to try and, and demonstrate competence in flexible endoscopy and get away a little bit from the numbers game in terms of, uh, of that. And we have one for uh, upper endoscopy and for colonoscopy, which has shown to be reliable and valid. And John already mentioned again the uh, the learning curves and the the sort of where it, it plateaus out as a way to try and, and, and get a more uh, data driven um, and an objective measure uh, of competence. So, a proposed training paradigm for the surgical endoscopist, I think. Getting FLS certification, most of them will already come in with FLS certification, so I think it's probably a good idea if they don't have it, but most of them already will. FES is coming soon, and that I think will be a good um, sort of baseline competency to, to make sure that they have all the sort of basic skills and cognitive knowledge to move forward in terms of doing advanced therapeutic endoscopy. And probably a few assessments in the live clinical environment using gauges to prove that they have those skills. I think it's important to actually also be involved in taking a GI bleed call and doing some emergency call to see some, how some of these more challenging interventions to keep a detailed case log, because for the moment, numbers 
are all we have, and I think it's, it's, it would be important to at least show, document some evidence of that. And for the rest of the stuff, I, I think for the moment, it's still really a, an apprenticeship, um, a proctored kind of training environment, similar to what our, our training programs really are for the moment. And for the future, I think it would be important for us to work together in terms of creating valid uh, and clinical outcome measures to measure the, the, the outcomes of these interventions and, and have benchmarks that we can establish for trainees. Um, and I think simulation can have a huge role to play in this, but obviously the more complex the skills become or uh, as, as they're more advanced, they're very individual and patient specific, it's kind of hard to, to in involve these in a, in a simulator, but a lot of hybrid sort of simulations that can involve patient scenarios and a lot of the cognitive information I think would be really important. And I think it's going to be an individual thing, uh, at least uh, for the moment and, and quite specialized, uh, but I think the surgeons can run high quality training fellowship programs and maybe it'll be module based in the future so maybe you will if you want to do sort of an ERCP module and you'll have to have had you know FES certification and approve a number of milestones before you can sort of qualify or build one module on another module um, I think that all theoretically could happen but I'm not aware of anything that exists like that for the moment so in summary I think surgeons can perform high quality endoscopy and as you've seen today are really leaders in the field of endoscopic surgery. I think we need to maintain high quality surgical endoscopy fellowships and try to keep sort of demonstrating that through the, the work that we're all doing in terms of trying to develop curricula and validate them. Um, and simulation I think has a role to play but obviously more work is needed in this area and um, thank you very much for your attention. <laughs>